Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to Politics 101, another edition, what we call our midweek edition of Politics 101. Uh, David Hines here, welcoming you from wherever you're joining us. Of course, if you're joining us from North America, uh, the United States and Canada, or you're joining us from the wider Caribbean, Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, St. Kitts, Nevis, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Antigua, Montserrat, uh, the Virgin Islands, uh, whether you're joining us from the US Virgin Islands or the British Virgin Islands, and those of you who are joining us um, from Suriname, French Guyana, welcome to uh, Politics 101. St. Martin, whether you're joining us from the Dutch side or the English side, welcome to Politics 101. And of course, those of you joining us from the homeland, from Guyana, big shout out to you if you're joining from the quarantine coast. New Amsterdam, welcome. Welcome to those of you, some of you uh, join us from Ithaca uh, on the West Bank, the West Bank of uh, the Burbis River. Welcome. Welcome from West Burbis, West Coast Burbis. Uh, good evening. Good evening to the people, wonderful people from that part of Guyana, West Coast Babies, Hope Town, Belladrum, Eldorado. Welcome, welcome to Politics 101. The numbers, number 28, number 25, wherever you are on the West Coast of Babies, welcome to Politics 101. Welcome down to Politics 101. I some of you are coming in very early. If you join us from the east coast of Demerara, welcome, welcome to Politics 101. You're joining us from Georgetown, 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 East Bank, Linden, Linden. If you're joining us from the East Bank, good evening to the people of Mocha, Arcadia. Zero one of our presence struggle. Welcome to Politics 101. Uh, the West Side, West Bank, West Bank, Stanley Tongue, Bagotstone, um, Bagotsville, sorry, Bagotstone's in East Bank, um, Wales, Good Intent, Sisters. Welcome to Politics 101, the West Coast of Demerara, Den Amstel. Blankenburg area, if you're joining us from Stroudville, and further down, the Essequibo coast, the west coast of Essequibo, people of Virgin Ocean, and all the way to Perico. Welcome to Politics 101. Good evening. It's a Thursday evening, and uh, sorry, Wednesday evening, or midweek, midweek edition, midweek edition. Welcome to you if you're joining us from the islands, Wakanam, Hog Island, Leg One, Fort Island, wherever you are in the islands there. How about if you're in Bartica? Welcome to Politics 101. Of course, Bartica is the gateway to uh, the hinterland. Those of you up there in Region 9, Region 8, welcome. The wider region seven, Bartik is part of region seven. Welcome to Politics 101, Wednesday evening. And of course, onto the Essequibo Coast. Essequibo Coast, whether you are in uh, Queenstown, one of the first villages, Queenstown, you're in the Anarijanga area, or you're all the way down to Charity, and all those villages along. The Essequibo Coast, 
Welcome to Politics 101. If some of you are joining us from uh, Port Morant on the quarantine or Albion, welcome. Welcome if you're from Enmore. Um, you know, these, pe these places do have um, people who are supporters of the opposition. Welcome. Welcome to you. Um, welcome to Politics 101. A beautiful country, Guyana, uh, despite all our uh, issues and our problems, Guyana remains our home, whether we call it home away from home, whether that home is India, or whether that home is Africa, or Portugal, or China. To our Amerindian brothers and sisters in the hinterland, and those who are not so far into the in Interland. Welcome to Politics 101. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to you. It's quite a time, a quite a time in the life of our country. The struggle goes on. The struggle goes on. The struggle goes on. Good evening, Deborah. Good evening, Everett. Um, good evening, Diane. Harriet, good evening. Um, Valdine, good evening. And good evening to you, Marlin, one of our regulars. Uh, tonight, we're going to be continuing that conversation. The struggle goes on. The struggle goes on. We cannot give up the struggle. We have to continue to fight. Fight we must. Good evening to my brother, Coffee. I think Coffee's from somewhere there on the west coast. Um, the west coast of Demerara, I um, visited um, the west coast, made a stop in Den Amstel and, and so forth. I went to Den Amstel twice, um, but once um, for political. Good evening. Good evening to you, Samuel. How are you, How are you Marlon? Marlon, I'm sorry. Good evening to politics. 101. We continue to um, carry the fight. We continue to carry the fight. We may disagree on the method. We may disagree on, on, on the pace. We may disagree on tactics, but the struggle goes on. Yes, a luta continua. The Spanish version of that well-known battle cry, the struggle goes on. Uh, those of you joining us from New Jersey, like Quito, welcome to Politics 101. My brother, Albert Morgan. Uh, good evening, Dr. Professor and Chief Hines. <laughs> I sometimes forget that I am an, I'm an African chief. <laughs> Sometimes forget that, um, but you know, um, uh, the, the struggle goes on. Thanks, thanks, Albert uh, Morgan for reminding me. Um, uh, good evening to Albert Morgan Jr., who is a fan of this program, uh, the Morgan family. Um, Morgan, of course, is all the way up in the quarantine, one of my favorite parts of our country, Union. 51, 52, a place I used to go to when I was a young man and was into drama. And we had uh, uh, several drama groups in Buxton that I was part of. And um, our brother and boy from Brooklyn worked at Albion Estate. And um, he stayed in Manchester. And um, uh, I think it was Vestalo's house in Manchester. And he stayed there, and uh, he would um, have us go up there and hold concerts along the uh, quarantine coast, and we would stay at that house in Manchester. Um, Vestalo, of course, famous Guyanese. Um, welcome to Politics 101. I enjoyed it. And I'm talking about 50, 50 odd years ago, 40 odd years ago. Um, and we would go to places like Union. Alness was not far from Manchester. We had lunches here. And, um, 
the villages along the coast a long time ago. Cherish memory. Good evening, Denny's Booker. Denny's Booker from Buxton. Good evening, Donna. Welcome to Politics 101. And the struggle continues. The struggle continues uh, because we are up against, we are up against it. We're up against it. Um, tonight is Wednesday night, and we're going to continue uh, to talk, to talk about how and what we are going to do about the present and how we are going to navigate the present. The question is that. It is clear, it is very clear that the government has made up its mind. It's made up its mind that it's not going to talk to us. It is not going to treat us as human beings, that it is going to bully its way and the question, what do you do when you're faced with such government? What do you do? Uh, people tell you that uh, we must work within the system, work within the system, work within the democratic system. But how do you work within the democratic system when uh, the government in power is undermining the very democratic system that they're asking you to work under. Where is the space for a democratic approach to change? You see, elections come every five years. And uh, in some situations, one cannot wait until five years to get redress. We are not against elections. In fact, elections, we understand, are very much part of the democratic process. And I reminded uh, some people this morning, they I was on the Buxtonian morning time or the Guyanese morning time. I, I understand the change your name, the Guyanese morning time. And I was on there this morning and um, during the calling period, people were of course very irate and they have good reason to be irate. And many people have reached a point where uh, they are calling for drastic and radical action. And I always say that what form the action takes is going to be determined by those with the power, the force in their hands. And I'm talking about the government. The government has state power in its hands and they will determine. And they're pushing a lot of our people to the edge. And when human beings get to the edge, they throw caution to the wind and understandably and lash out. I am very, very, very understanding and sympathetic to that kind of response from our people. And in the process, we become very critical of ourselves, self-criticism, I do not have a problem with that. We lash out at our own leaders. And then eventually lash out at our people, our own people. And you know, I had to remind people this morning that when in their frustration, they're lashing out, they must remember that the people, our people, opposition supporters, um, who we are criticizing for doing nothing, not standing up to the PPP. I have to remind them that in 2011, 
our people by their votes created a minority government. The PPP had to go to early elections. And in 2015, our people by their votes removed the PPP. Something people felt was impossible. That was only a mere seven years ago. And we had to get those people to the polls. Of course, they were Amerindian votes and um, some East Indian votes, but the majority of votes for the coalition were African votes, votes from the African community. And those people we are criticizing today for not getting up and fighting, they fought with the vote in their hand. And we have to get them to the polls, you know. People don't go to the polls just like that. You have to convince them. They have to become sensitized. They have to become conscious. And they went to the polls and did it impossible. They removed the PPP. Now, I understand that we are frustrated today that they are not rising up and going into the streets and all of that kind of stuff. I understand that, but we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. Those very people, I saw young people in 2011, 2015, young black people, 17, 18, 19, 20, coming out of the party and voting like a boss. As I said this morning, I was there. I was part of the team that helped to motivate them and inspire them to go to the polls. So when we are being critical of those people, we must ask a basic question. Why is it those people who voted like a boss in 2011, 2015, and 2020? Why are they not coming out on the streets in numbers right now? What has changed? I saw those people who we are criticizing today for inaction and for being oblivious. In 2011, 2015, 2020, the votes are about the same. In fact, in 2020, there were more votes than 11 and 15. Those people who we are criticizing today took action. So we have to be very careful when we are making these criticisms of ordinary people. We must ask the question that in two and a half years, what has changed? What has changed? And I want to submit that we have to discuss very frankly the question of power. Very, very frankly, the question of power. What has changed is that we don't have power. And given the way things are, it doesn't look as though power will come, in, come our way shortly. People are not robots, you know, they're people are thinkers. We may not agree with the way they think all times, but people are much more conscious and educated about the situation than we think. Every time I am in Guyana and I go and talk with people, I'm amazed at their consciousness of the environment. What has changed in two and a half years? In two and a half years, we have not been in power, the opposition. And the opposition has not been able to use the system to do anything for their people, anything significant. 
because in two and a half years, we have had a government that has closed all doors to democratic involvement of geography. Let's reason this thing through. As opposition, we have not been able to use the system to bring relief to our people, economic relief, political relief. We have not been able to use the system to win political victories. Let's be frank. So therefore, we have to talk about the question of power. There are two ways you can hold power in Guyana if you are running as political parties. You either win power by yourself as the PPP. Well, we can't say they won because in my estimation, I don't know who won the election. But you can win power and use it on your own, or you can do as they do in places like Switzerland and Suriname and Belgium and so forth. You can share power. We in Guyana have talked a lot about sharing power, but I don't think we have convinced the Guyanese people. Maybe we have not tried enough that sharing power is one form of ensuring that you hold the power. Maybe we have not been able to convince our major leaders. When the PPP was in opposition in the 70s and the 80s, they were in favor of sharing power. They came out with a power sharing proposal in 1977 called a National Patriotic Front, in which they were prepared to share power with the PNC, even giving the presidency to the PNC. And then again, in 1985, just before Mr. Burnham died, they began to talk. And they had worked out a power sharing arrangement with the PNC in which I think they were prepared to give the presidency again to the PNC. Mr. Burnham died and Mr. Hoy did not continue it. In 1990, when elections were due, after Jimmy Carter's intervention, and they could not get a, voters, a new voters list in time, so the elections had to be postponed for two years. The WPA proposed to the PPP that we approach the, the, the PNC for a power sharing government among the three parties for the two years between 1990, 1990, 1990 and 1992. The PPP wasn't convinced that the PNC would do it. WPA went, approached the PNC and Desmond Hoyt said, yes, he's prepared to do it. But they didn't get anywhere because the PPP didn't want to do it. You know, they felt that they were going to win the 92 election. And so they turned their backs on power sharing. What I'm saying here is the PPP, while they were out of power, they were in favor of sharing power with the PNC. Once they smelt power, they turned their backs on power sharing. They wanted all the power or, or nothing. When the APNU came to power, it said that it was interested in sharing power. It appointed Mr. Nagamutu to begin to talk with the PPP. The PPP said it didn't want to talk to Nagamutu. Mr. Hoyt, Mr. Granger, 
at least held out the olive branch. And the PPP said no. We would learn later that they were not interested in sharing power because they had begun to plot to get rid of the coalition government, which they did by recruiting Mr. Sharon Das to vote with them in the no confidence motion. So the question of power has to be raised. The PPP with a few more votes in a disputed election are wielding tremendous power. There may be an illegitimate government, but they are a legal government because they've been sworn in and they've been recognized by the opposition and foreign forces. But just with a few more votes, just with 50.5% of the vote, let's say 51%, they are wielding 100% of the power. That is the difference between 2000 and now is that one side has all the institutional power, is using them indiscriminately, using that power. And the other side has no institutional power and is not even allowed to influence token decisions. The question of power. The PNC and the other opposition parties have to look at the question of power and ask ourselves whether we want to gamble to get back power just for ourselves and to probably do like the PPP is doing, or are we going to say we represent half of the electorate and we, des we deserve at a minimum half of the power. What is power? I don't have to get into the theoretical definition of power. Power is what the PPP has and what it is using. The power to seize people land. The power to bulldoze people's houses. The power to decide who gets what, when, and how. Whether it's cane cutters, sugar workers, fishermen and women, they have the power to decide who gets what, when, and how much. That's power. As we get into the theoretical, that's the practical. They have the power to mount an elections commission on their own. They have the power with one seat majority. to decide what bill goes to the parliament and to decide the outcome of the bills that go to parliament. They have the power and they are using it viciously. We do not have any, any institutional power. We cannot decide how much money is given to public servants. We cannot decide how much money is given to the police and the soldiers. We cannot order the police to go out and to confront protesters. We cannot order the soldiers. We do not have institutional power. The question here is power.
I'm not getting into when we had power for five years, what we did and what we didn't do. Not tonight. Tonight, I want us to look to the future and ask ourselves of power. Portuguese and Chinese people are in the private sector. They control a lot of the wealth of the country. They were given affirmative action in the 19th century. When they couldn't make it on the cane field, the colonial government sponsored them to get into business. When in the 20th century, East Indians began to come off the plantation, they were also sponsored into the private sector. Black people, on the other hand, who went into the private sector immediately as they got out of slavery. The first big, big private sector initiative was when they bought lands. All those lands all that we call villages, they bought them. That, that's a big entrepreneurship. And they bought them and they turned them into villages. But what happened immediately? The government, the colonial government used policies to restrict how much land they could buy. To raise the real estate, to re raise the price of land, to price black people out of buying more land. The colonial government destroyed the agriculture sector in which black people were dominant. So while we have government promoting three ethnic groups into the private sector, helping them to create wealth by their very policies, And so here we are in 2022, because of the government system and government policies, more than 90% of the wealth are in government hands, are in, are in the hands, sorry, not government, are in the hands of three ethnic groups. And look at what the PPP has done since it came back to power in 1992. It has used government resources to create a new class of East Indian and Portuguese entrepreneurs. We all know the story of people who owned one lorry, and today they own tremendous wealth of people who couldn't build roads, but were given contracts, road contracts, today they're billionaires. Sisters and brothers are making the point that economic power in Guyana has always been sponsored by the government, whether it's the colonial government, whether it's the colonial government, or the post-colonial government. Let us not fool ourselves that some or the other ethnic groups can gain economic power without the sponsoring of government. The PPP has been prepared to use government, to use formal power to create opportunities for economic wealth for East Indians and Portuguese and Chinese.
And we see since they've come to power in 2022, they are giving handouts to some communities that could facilitate the starting up of a small business. I mean, if you got $250,000, it's not a lot of money, but you can start a small business. But then you go into the black community, give them $20,000. That can barely buy two days food, much more to start a small business. These are deliberate policies. And the PPP is able to do it because it has power. I don't know that I would want our side to get into power and to use it unfairly like the PPP is doing. I don't know that I support that. But I do support the point that we have to begin to think about getting power. So our first order of business is to survive this onslaught. And we can only survive this onslaught first with self-defense, defending ourselves. We are under attack. Not, I'm not saying that because I want to say it. The evidence is there. The physical evidence of Wisma, Amelia's word, sorry, George Dong, now the people at Moko. The evidence is there with what brother Nigel Hughes, Nigel Hughes has prepared. The economic assault, where in the major economic sectors, the major wealth creating sectors, in every one of them, the government has stared resources to communities of their preference and not to the black community. The evidence is there. We are under economic attack, political attack, physical attack, cultural attack. And if you're under attack, you must defend yourself. I have no compunctions. I'm not playing around anymore if I used to play around before. And we should not play around anymore as if we used to play around before. We've got to defend ourselves economically. We have got to defend ourselves politically. We have got to defend ourselves against physical attack. No one should be arguing that now. And we cannot defend ourselves within the system. As I pointed out, in every area of governance, the PPP has locked the door, pushed us out in the rain, pushed us out with the elements. We are outside the formal system. So we cannot defend ourselves in the system. We have to defend ourselves outside of the system. If anyone shows me some democratic space in which the opposition, in which African Guyanese could defend ourselves, they are the courts. We have gone to the courts. We have lost more than we have won. I continue to think that we should go to the courts. But the courts are not set up to solve political problems. And often we are forced to go to the courts to solve political problems because we have nowhere else to go. So we are not politicizing the judiciary. 
We have to go to the judiciary because the legislative branch and the executive branch are closed to us. So when I hear scholars talk the nonsense about going to the judiciary to solve political problems, I say, yes, we ought not to do that. The judiciary is not set up to solve political problems. The judiciary is set up to mediate the law. But if the other two branches have pushed us out in the rain, we can only go for shelter in the courts. And the courts have more often than not pushed us out back in the rain. So we are left outside of the system. We have to protect and defend ourselves outside the system. The spirit that took us to the polls in 2011, 2015, and 2020, that spirit we have to rekindle to defend ourselves. This is not about individual defense. This is about collective defense. To watch people who could not defend themselves in Amelia's ward in Linden, could not defend themselves in Georgetown, could not defend themselves at Moko. It's a crime. What more do we want to see before we come to the conclusion that we have to pivot and go into self-defense mode? And my conversation is not about how and when and where. That is not a conversation, as we would say in Guyana, for polite company. But I'm prepared to say in polite company that we have to defend ourselves or we're dead. Dead physically, dead economically, dead politically, dead culturally. If we do not defend ourselves. What is the job of leadership? Aubrey North is the talk of the town. And when you do, what has he been doing? What has he not been doing? Understandably so. Aubrey Norton belongs to a political party that advances the notion of the one-man leader. Although Aubrey himself has said he doesn't want to be a one-man leader. The fact is that his party over the decades has projected the, the leader, the maximum leader as the Messiah. So although Aubrey is saying that he's not, he doesn't want to be the maximum leader, his members and supporters see him as the Messiah who must come up with the grand plan and march us to victory. And I know of no revolution, I know of no transformation where a single leader was able to do it alone. Dr. Martin Luther King used his oratory. He used his majestic presence to inspire the civilized movement, inspire it, inspire. Inspire the children to fa face the water hoses. Inspire the civil rights workers to join the struggle. Fidel Castro and Che Guevara and the other revolutionaries 
landed in Cuba from Mexico. And they were able to inspire Cubans, Cuban peasants, Cuban people to join them. And they took control of territories, power. And they used that power to march into Havana. Leadership is important, but leadership by itself can do this work. And so as we criticize the leaders, we must criticize them for not doing enough to inspire our people. We inspired our people in 2015, 2011, 2020 to spread, to use the vote to shove down the walls of wicked power. And that is what leadership has to do. It has to inspire you to come and join our ranks. And if we are failing as a leadership, is our inability to inspire people, more people. We cannot substitute leader power for people's power. Every effective leader has had to rely on the power of the people. So our task is to inspire you to join the struggle in tangible ways. That's where I think the criticism is. There are some spontaneous things we can do. We can take up our placard and go, we've been doing that. Kidaki has been doing that. The PNC has been doing that. But we notice that those symbolic actions important, but not enough. You cannot fight a sledgehammer. With a pen knife. You cannot fight a bulldozer with a bicycle. You cannot. We have to now utilize all forms of struggle. The placard is an important weapon. But a placard against a bulldozer is no match. We have to develop our own bulldozers. The government has the bulldozer of force, the bulldozer of indiscriminate force. We have to create bulldozers of self-defense to match bulldozer with bulldozer. There is a place for venting our anger. There is a place for throwing out ideas about what should be done. But there is a more important place where we have to sit down away from the glare of the cameras. Away from the air shot of the oppressor. Away from the clutches of the agents of the oppressor. And to strategically plan our way out of danger. Now it's time for us to join 
our political parties, join our black organizations so that together we can work this thing out. As I said, away from the glare of the cameras, away from the glare of the wicked oppressors, away from the glare and the clutches of the Uncle Toms and Auntie Toms, Our job here is to inspire you. The government knows the importance of the job we are doing. They call it inside. They say we are inciting you. We are inciting people to defend themselves against illegal force, indiscriminate force, is called inspiring. I want to inspire you all here to do something tangible. Many of you on this live are not physically in Guyana. That's okay. But you do have an interest in Guyana. And in this global world, you too can be part of the planning for self-defense. We've got to organize and mobilize ourselves. There are hundreds of ways to defend ourselves. We often say that, you know, you talk too much. I, 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 I just explained that Dr. King led a movement, one of the largest mass movements of the 20th century, led it with oratory, his oration, the words of his mouth, inspired the hearts of thousands and millions of black Americans to take action in their own name. There is a place for inspiring people, encouraging people, giving them the confidence. And that's what we are doing. If we have a microphone in front of us in January of 2023, we must not only use it to expose, we must not only use it to cuss out the other side, we must, but we must use it to inspire our people to remove themselves from the shadows and to join the struggle in active ways. I joined the struggle at the age 15. I was inspired by the words and the action of AUC Kwayana and later Walter Rodney, Rupert Rupnora and Clive Thomas and Daniel Bonita Harris. They inspired me as a 15, 16 year old to come off the road and to come into the struggle. And not to come into the struggle for a position in the party, but to come into the struggle to make the ultimate sacrifices for the convictions that we shared at that time. My job, or part of my job, part of our job is to inspire other 15-year-olds to come into the struggle, not for positions in a party, not to become a treasurer, not to become a general secretary, but to become soldiers who are prepared to sac 
sacrifice. I've never been a parliamentarian. And I've given almost 50 years of sacrifice to our struggle for a better Guyana. I've never been a parliamentarian. I do not feel diminished. I feel that I've contributed equally and sometimes more than parliamentarians. Because in my time, as I said, as a 15 year old, no one dangled parliament in front of me. But today, young people walk off the streets and become parliamentarians and become treasurer of parties and become general secretary of parties. So that today they argue in who signed blank check rather than arguing about who is standing in the vanguard of the struggle against wickedness. We have to inspire people to be fighters. In some ways, we the ordinary people have encouraged slackness from our political leaders. Because we don't tell our political leaders where to get off. When they do stupidness. Or because we think it's only one set of political leaders from one party that can win for us. And when, the, when those political leaders from that political party don't get it together, we are in deep doo-doo. We, we decide that some political leaders are good for one thing, but not good for the other thing. I do appreciate all those of you who give me a hearing. All those of you who think that I have something to say or something to contribute. But I want you to make the next step. And that is to join me. I can't do this on my own. To join my ranks. Whether you want to call yourself a supporter, a member, it doesn't matter to me. But I want, when I look around, when I look around, I must see a fair lens of supporters with me. I, 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 I'm not saying that I don't, they're not supporters out there. I think I do have and we do have, and by we I mean the political party that I belong to, because I'm not a one-man army. I do believe that we have supporters out there, but I want the supporters to come out of the shadows. So that when I go and I sit down with other political leaders, I can say, my supporters have sent me here. Not just my party, but my supporters. I identify with those who you believe have the potential to help us get out of this nonsense that we're in. If I, I inspire you, join me. And we will join with those who Aubrey Norton inspires and those who
Brother Sherrod inspires. And those who the black organizations act on and in part G inspire. So that we can have an army, a political army. That will build our bulldozers of self-defense. If the people of Mokko were mobilized for self-defense, that interaction on the streets there would have been different. We have to be frank with ourselves. What are we telling our people when we go into the communities? What are we doing? Are we preparing them to face the bulldozers that we know will be coming? The struggle goes on. The struggles will have to be won. Guyana will be no Guyana if one side takes blows and put our tails between our legs and sit and wait for the next bulldozer. Or are we going to tangibly prepare our own bulldozers I believe in bulldozers of love. I believe in bulldozers of nationhood. I believe in bulldozers of unity. But I also believe in bulldozers that repel more dangerous bulldozers. We've got to take action now. We have to do some new things. Go join your political parties if you like them. Don't join with your political leaders if you like them. But join you must. You Now is the time for us to move to the point of organizing and mobilizing ourselves to defend our dignity, to defend our birthright, to defend our economic rights. Let us resolve that Moko Arcadia must be the last place that our children should watch being bulldozed. I joined the struggle at 15, I said. Fobbs Burnham was 30 years old in 1953. Kelly Jagan was 35. AUC Kwayana was 28. Martin Carter was 26. Ashton Chase was 24. Young men and women who held political office. We have to bring in our young people into this struggle. Yes, we have to criticize them, but we spend too much of time saying what people are not doing rather than we ourselves join in the advance army to go and get them and bring them into the struggle. If I inspire you in a small way, 
join me in an tangible way. I looking wrong and I seen some shadows. I looking wrong and I seen some gestures. But I want when I look around to see real people. Real people. Real people. Real people. Real souls. Real soldiers. See you tomorrow. We're gonna have some guests tomorrow. We're gonna have some, we have not guests for the last two days. I've been doing my thing by myself because I wanted to get some stuff in tomorrow night. Um, I think Lincoln Lewis is coming. I'm trying to get um, brother um, Nigel London and some other people to come in because Nigel was in the forefront in Linden when they were bulldozing the people at Linden. So he knows something about fighting bulldozing. So I'm gonna have some of my friends tomorrow to come here and for us to continue to do the inspiration, inspiring you so that you can join. Whether you're 18 years or 19 years or 20 years, get in touch with me. Get in touch with our party. Get in touch with us, get in touch with our party and let's talk about what we can do together. I have told brother Aubrey Norton that we in the WPA are not fighting the PNC. We may differ and we have differences with the PNC, but we're not fighting them because we have a bigger fight and that uh, we have to share our people. We have to share um, the soldiers. One is certain that if you are mad at Norton and the PNC, your alternative is not the PPP. One alternative is the WP. One alternative is the WP. And I've been at it from the turn of this year, been talking more and more about my party and my own role in that context. Because people have been asking, so Dr. Hines, are you just an analyst? No, I'm more than an analyst, I'm an activist. And I'm not an activist just to analyze and criticize, but I'm in the struggle. I'm in the struggle. I'm in the struggle. My party, our party, is in the struggle. And there is space in our ranks. Lots of space in our ranks. Join us. And if you don't like us, join the PNC. And if you don't like them, join the AFC. Uh, you know, they're part of the opposition, the AFC. And if you don't like them, Join Coffee 250, join Agda, join it Padre G. But put on your bucket somewhere, come off the shelf, come off the corners. This is not a concert. This is serious business. Tomorrow night, my friends are going to be here for you to hear from them. Good night. Love is always my guiding star. I love you because you're human. I love you because we share heritage. I love you because even if I don't share heritage with you, I share political perspective with you. I love you because if I, even if I don't share political perspective and I don't share heritage, I share social class, the same kind, we are all sufferers. I know sometimes I don't speak directly to our Indian brothers and sisters who are on this live. And I apologize for that, but I love you too. Because it takes courage for the Portuguese and the Indians and the Amerindians to join us 
I love you too. And I apologize for not speaking directly to you always. Brother Sam Cook says, change is gonna come. Change is gonna come. Not far from now, change is gonna come.